We've just had an incredible decade for the equity market. We've seen a very strong rally in certain sectors and certain strategies. So we'll start this video looking at which strategies have performed best, both active and passive. Then we'll look at what's happened since we got the very sharp sell-off in March 2020, and then the very rapid rebound which followed after the Fed announced that it was going to buy in unlimited quantities. Now remember, you can ask this kind of question whenever you like if you're part of our Patreon community. It costs just $10 a month, plus you get access to the chat application called Slack, and you get to join our live Sunday evening Q&A session when you can ask any question you like, and I'll answer in detail. And if you miss it, you can always catch up on the replays. And we're getting an increasingly large library of those replays, which are now available. So now let's look at those equity strategies in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Let's start off by looking at the difference between an active and a passive approach to investing. The first person to really question the wisdom of active management was Burton G. Malkiel in his classic book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. This was first published in the 1970s, but it's now in its 12th edition. What this graph shows is the outperformance of funds versus indices. This is for US funds tracked from 1970 to 2017. Now in 1970, there were only 358 funds that started out. But of those, 280 have been wound up or merged into other funds, and only 78 of the active funds now survive. The goal of an active manager is to outperform their index or their benchmark. That might be the S&P 500, for example. And they do that by choosing stocks which are better than the general market, in their opinion. And if they're proven to be right, then their fund will outperform the index. But what was shocking at the time was that Malkiel showed that funds underperform their index most of the time, net of fees. Because so many funds failed to survive, and those which did didn't always outperform, the probability of choosing a winner at the beginning of that period in 1970 was very low, just 8%. The company S&P has taken that approach, extended it, and tracked many different active fund managers over a very long period of time, both in the US and internationally. And they publish this every six months in their SPIVA report, which stands for S&P Index versus Active. And the latest scorecard from the end of 2019 they showed that for a 15-year period, only about 10% of companies outperformed their index. And for the US market, it didn't matter whether that was large companies or small companies. In other words, the probability of choosing a successful fund manager, which does beat the index in return for higher fees, is very low, at about 10%. Now, during a bear market, when equity markets have sold off, this is supposed to be a great opportunity for stock pickers because some companies, which fundamentally are very good, may have been unfairly punished by the market simply by virtue of being an equity. So in theory, stock pickers should outperform in this kind of market. However, in 2008, that really wasn't the case. For large cap funds, only about a half of the active fund managers outperform their benchmarks. And for mid cap and small cap funds, the outperformance was even less likely. And when the dot-com bubble burst between 2000 and 2002, the levels of underperformance were similar. Now that was for the US market. If you're interested, you can also see my interview with Andrew Innes, who writes the European version of the Spiva report. And what he finds is very similar to the US market, which is that active managers, net of fees, tend to underperform their benchmarks. Now for the funds that are successful, the question is whether that's a matter of skill or simply luck. To address that question, S&P produces the Persistent Scorecard. To answer that question, S&P ranks active managers, let's say we had 100 of them, from best performing fund on the left to worst performing fund on the right. Then they track the best 25% of those funds over time to see whether they carried on being outperforming. The logic behind this is very simple. If outperformance is due to skill, it should persist over time. If outperformance is due to luck, then it won't persist. This is data from the 2019 Persistence Scorecard for the United States, 
We start off with that group of outperforming fund managers at the beginning of September 2015. Now you might expect that after one year, the vast majority of those fund managers would still be outperforming. They'd still be in the top 25%. However, that's not true. Only about a fifth of them remain outperforming. In year two, the number which remain outperforming falls further to 6.5%. In year three to 4%, and in year four, under 1% of those outperforming funds remained outperforming. Another way they look at that is to look at two successive five-year periods. So in the first five-year period, they'd break the fund managers into four quartiles. The first quartile is the best performing funds, and the fourth quartile are the worst performing funds. Then they simply look to see which of the funds were also best performing in the following five-year period. And again, what they find, for fund managers which were first quartile in the first five-year period, only 32% of them remained first quartile in the second five-year period. Many of them had moved to the second quartile, third quartile, or even the fourth quartile, and about 8% of the funds, presumably the underperforming ones, were merged or liquidated. If we look at that graphically, if performance was completely random, we'd expect those categories to be about 25% because there are four quartiles. And what's shocking is that we're not far above that random performance. So based on this data, it seems as if the funds which do outperform aren't consistent. And that makes it more difficult for people to find funds which will outperform in future if past outperformance isn't a good guide to future outperformance. If there is any good news from this persistent scorecard data, it's that the bottom quartile moves to the top quartile about 11% of the time. So the worst performing funds this year may become better performing in future. But in fact, the most likely fate for that bottom quartile is to be merged or liquidated. In order to understand this crisis, it's really important to see what's happened with US sectors. Now, there are 11 of those sectors, but what I'm going to do is look at what happened to the best performing and worst performing sectors so far. So I've assumed you've invested $1 in an energy ETF and a healthcare ETF in the United States at the peak of the market on February the 19th, 2020. Notice how healthcare falls much less than energy. And that's for fairly obvious reasons, given the nature of the crisis, but also given what happened to the price of oil. Then when the Fed announced that it would buy an unlimited amount on March the 23rd, markets started to turn around. And although in percentage terms, energies rallied more than healthcare, that's not enough to compensate for the fall it's already had. Healthcare is pretty much back where it started, but energy is still down by about 30%. If we rank all 11 US sectors, according to the performance of these sector ETFs, from the peak on February the 19th to the end of April, you can see the sectors which have lost least are healthcare, consumer staples, and technology. And the ones which have suffered most have been industrials, financials, and energy. Now, this probably isn't the end of the crisis. And if we do get another sell-off, it may resemble this pattern. And if that's true, then these would be the most defensive sectors, and these would be the least defensive sectors, in that sell-off. And if markets rally, then it's usually the ones which have sold off the most which tend to rally the most. Although you might want to be careful with energy given that the price of oil simply hasn't recovered yet. If we represent that data slightly differently, think of this as a bounce plot. The red bar is a fall from the peak to the trough. The blue bar is the bounce back from the lowest point on March the 23rd till the end of April. And the green bar is the overall return. So here are those three defensive sectors on the right-hand side, which have sold off the least overall. And here are the three sectors, energy, financials, and industrials, which has sold off the most. Now, generally, the sectors which have performed the best are the ones which also sold off the least, with the possible exception of communication services. And that's because if you fall by 57%, it takes a much bigger return in order to take you back to where you started. Now, one of the things that characterizes this market is that it's recovered very quickly, despite economic data, which is getting ever worse. There's a huge disparity between the economic data and what's happening in markets. And that's one of the things which we've been discussing in our weekly market roundup. 
So to keep track of what's going on, there's no better way than to sign up for that. And it's completely free. The link is just above me. So in terms of strategy, how well did the stock pickers do during this sell-off? This is a piece of research done by SCM Direct and published on April the 8th of this year. Now this is for UK fund managers and this is the average return year to date to the 31st of March in sterling terms. And they've broken it down by regional funds. Here are the benchmark returns and you can see that on average all of the regions have underperformed except for Europe which is roughly neck and neck with its benchmark. So out of those 627 funds, the average underperformance was about minus 2%. What's great about this report is that it actually shows you the distribution of returns relative to the benchmark. So to the right of zero here would be outperformance, to the left would be underperformance, and the dashed line shows that on average funds have underperformed. But of course not all of them have. Some of them have outperformed. All we're really talking about here is the average performance. If we look at UK focused funds, the underperformance is still negative and it's slightly larger than it is for all funds. Those SPIVA reports come out every six months, so we're going to have to wait to see how well they performed so far in 2020. Now, people who invest in active funds generally look at the ones which have outperformed over the past decade. They may also look at the style of the fund and find one that they like. So what I've done here is rather like that, but instead it's for passive funds. I filtered by the largest funds and I plotted the return between 2011, March the 16th, and the end of April. So that's on the y-axis with high returns at the top and low returns at the bottom. And on the x-axis, I've got the risk that was used to generate that return with high risk on the right as measured by volatility and low risk on the left. Now I've only taken the best performing funds over that period of time and there are some really noticeable patterns. So for example the best performing fund is the iShares Nasdaq 100 tracker but notice that appears twice, once in sterling at the top here and once in US dollars below and that's because of the 23% devaluation of sterling versus the US dollar which means that dollar investments have gained in value in sterling terms. So if you expect that to continue, that should perhaps be part of your investment strategy if you're a sterling investor. Another thing to notice is that many of these are tech funds. So here's a biotech fund, here's another biotech fund, a semiconductor fund, a software fund, and of course healthcare has performed well too. And we also see funds which are exposed to the US have performed better than others. So for example, the NASDAQ is a US index. And this is a US medical devices fund. And here's another US technology fund. So the sector composition is very important in driving returns over this decade. If we do the same thing with active funds, what's really striking is you see similar attributes. A lot of the funds are US based, particularly US growth funds. And US growth has done particularly well over this period. Here's a Bailey Gifford American fund. Here's another US growth fund managed by Morgan Stanley. But again, we're also seeing the sectors pop up. Global technology, healthcare, more technology, health science. And here are the two very popular UK active funds, Fundsmith Equity and Lindsell Train Global Equity. And if we combine the two groups of funds so that we have the active funds in red and we have the passive funds in blue, the best performing fund would have been a sterling denominated NASDAQ 100 tracker. And if you're willing to weather very high volatility, this Spider S&P Biotech tracker was particularly good. So for the passive funds, these biotech, internet and semiconductor funds certainly gave the active funds a very good run for their money. Now if we look at those bounce plots using those active and passive funds, we can see that same pattern. The passive funds which had performed best were those biotech sectors, biotechnology and internet stocks. And this biotech fund on the far right is actually above where it was just before the sell-off. So if you do like passive funds and you think the stock market's going to fall again, then you probably go for the sectors which fell least and perhaps even the funds which fell least previously. So that might be this iShares NASDAQ tracker. If you think this momentum rally is going to continue, then perhaps you want to stick with the funds 
which have rallied the most since the trough, so that might be medical devices or biotech. If we do the same bounce plot for active funds, and you think the momentum is going to continue, then that Bailey Gifford American fund might be one to consider. Whereas if you think markets are going to fall again, perhaps you'd go for one of the ones which sold off least, such as this US growth fund from Morgan Stanley, or Fundsmith Equity, which only lost 19.3%, or perhaps this global healthcare fund, which only lost 18.5%. So it's interesting that whether they're active or passive, the funds which have performed best have been the ones with exposure to those few sectors, but also to the United States, which has been by far the best performing country. So I hope you do join us on Patreon, and I hope we'll see you soon on one of those Sunday evening calls. And as always, thank you for listening.